Mr. Axford? Pretty good for someone who's never seen the Green Hornet, Mr. Wilman. Ah, I've your descriptions in the center, not to thank for that. Hmm. Paul. Yes, Mr. Wilman. Uh, my assistant, Paul Garrett, Mr. Axford. How do you do? Uh, now, I think we could get a better effect with the lighting. Yes, sir. This way, gentlemen and lady. They've all been stars in the Chamber of Evil at one time or another, and most of them of death row, I might add. Colonel Stanhope Blaine, who never was a colonel, and who found that buttermilk was the most effective means of feeding arsenic to half a dozen wealthy widows. Jake Rack, who insisted he killed on the instruction of the little people, and suggested that they be hanged instead of him. James Rankert, Mr. Axford, my partner and historian. Well, he knows more about those figures than the authorities. Jimmy the Gun. The Yellow Gang's executioner. By police estimate, he killed over a hundred gangsters in the Yellow Kid's battle with Lenny White for control of illicit whiskey and beer. Lenny and the Kid made their peace. Jimmy the Gun was out of work, so he killed them both. The Scar. Identity unknown. For years before the arrival of the Green Hornet, the Star of the Chamber of Evil, Urbane, ruthless, contemptuous of the police, he killed by using a white scarf as a garret. He was never captured. And then, oh, more than 20 years ago, he simply vanished. But even the greatest can be replaced, as will the Green Hornet himself one day. Now, if you'd like to take your photographs, uh, I'll be at the library pretty late, Peter. I'm revising my lecture notes considerably to... Uh, Relate our guest to our new star. I may still be here when you get back, James. My workroom needs tidying. Uh, Paul will let you gentlemen out and uh, lock up when he leaves. Thank you all. Another challenge for the Green Hornet, his aide Cato, and their rolling arsenal, the Black Beauty. On police records, a wanted criminal, the Green Hornet is really Britt Reed, owner-publisher of the Daily Sentinel. His dual identity, known only to his secretary and to the district attorney. And now, to protect the rights and lives of decent citizens, rides the Green Hornet.
about four or five feet away from me. And, and then he started coming at me with this scarf. He walked kind of strange and, and, and funny, stiff-like. And, and his face, what I remember of his face, what I could see of it, it was kind of glossy-like. Like wax, you mean? Yes, yes, it was kind of shiny like that. Yes, well, uh, thank you, miss. Mr. Graham here will take you to the photo gallery. I'll have a reporter take your story. Thank you. It's impossible, Mike. Not to Peter Wilman. He isn't given much of a chance to live. She couldn't have made that story up. I was in the squad room at the 21st, passing the time of evening with Sergeant Doyle when she came in. Mike, the desk wants you. A park policeman has spotted a bearded man. He lost him in the fog, but he found a dead man lying beside a park bench. He said he'd been strangled. One nine four in, one nine four in. Another sighting, Grove and Maple. Swing that way, one nine four. Right. Moving which way? South on Maple. Right. Let's go. Mr. Reed's residence. It's Miss Case. Thanks, Kito. Yes, Miss Case? Mike just called from police headquarters. The scarf was just interrupted during an attack. One of the officers thinks he might have wounded him, probably in the left shoulder, and then they lost him in the fog. Thanks. How are you coming with that research? Well, there isn't very much so far. Do you still want me to come by after I've finished? Since the man's still at large, yes. Still at large. Police made contact with him, shot at him. They lost him in the fog, but they think they wounded him. Well, that should ease the panic. Convince people that there isn't a waxen dummy running around wild. What is running around wild, Frank, and why? Uh, that's a good question. The first person attacked was Peter Wilman. What does that do for us? That gives us a direction. Mr. Reed's office. Yes, sir. What's the latest report on the condition of Peter Wilman? Critical. He's still unconscious. Anything else? A man named James Rancourt wanted to reach Mike. He said that uh, he heard the news when he left the library earlier. He was Wilman's partner. I referred him to police headquarters. Thanks, Miss Case. There's got to be an answer somewhere. Well, it started in Wilman's museum. Yeah, and maybe that's where it will end. See if you can locate the light switch.
clothes are damp. There are many legendary figures of evil in the Orient. Some people say they are often driven back to action by their own malevolence. this uh, James Rancourt who wrote this? He's Wilman's partner in the museum. Does research and lectures on the tours. There's one piece of information in there that interests me. Vina Rose, the burlesque queen that the scarf used to date. Well, finding a stripper who worked this town 10 or 15 years ago is like finding a wide open back entrance to Fort Knox. Yeah, but I found her. Our entertainment editor called a booking agent. He remembered her. Her real name is Hazel Smith. She lives in a small apartment in the Chelsea district. <laughs> want to talk to me about who was the scarf what was his real name i don't know you see he always just sort of showed up and he never made no passes then why did he keep coming back beats me unless maybe it was because i was a good listener you know I used to walk into my room, see? And there he'd be, just sitting in the dark. He had a great big bottle of cold champagne and caviar, just as black as the inside of your pocket and, and those little tiny crispy crackers. And then he'd start to talk. <laughs> I tell you, he could just talk your arm right off the shoulder. And you loved it. About completely ruthless murders. No. No, never. We, we never talked about that, and I never believed he did any of them things. He always treated me just like a queen. He was a murderer once. He could be again. No. No, and anyway, I, I know he's dead. I know it. Well, he would have come to see me again if he hadn't been dead, and, and he never did. Have you ever been to the Wax Museum and seen the figure they have of him there? No. no I couldn't stand it. When was the last time that you saw him? Well, I was, uh, I was leaving the Burley house and I was going to go to a hamburger joint to get a hamburger. It was after the midnight show, so it was late. It, it always was late when I seen him. And when I come out of the stage door, there he was. He was outside, outside in a car waiting for me. He, he said he was going away, because he was going to be immortal. So people would never forget him all those years. That's what he wanted. Then he, he dropped me by the hamburger joint, and well, that was it. And you still couldn't believe about the robberies and the murders? I tell you, he treated me like a queen, like a queen! Uh... Mr. Reed, 
That's right. I'm James Rancourt. Mr. Rancourt, have a seat. How would you like to make a thousand dollars for a day or two's work? I'd like to make a thousand dollars, Mr. Reed, but I'm not aware of anything I could do to earn it. Mr. Axford tells me that you're the researcher for the Wilman Museum. Yes, and his partner. It has been a long and fruitful association. And you'd made a thorough study of the scarf? Yes. I had hoped to publish a book on the man. I found him fascinating. He was quite peculiar in his invincibility. How do you feel about the scarf being at large tonight? Oh, I shudder. But I fear we shall have to accept what people have seen. Good. Make that the tone of your article. Is your research material readily accessible? The main body of it is at the museum. Fine. I'd like for you to go through the Sentinel's files and select some pictures to go with your article. Then you can pick up your research material. It's always good to give photographic proof to your readers. Uh, Mr. Reed, unfortunately, I'm not a very fast typist. <laughs> Mr. Rancor, we have a lot more typists here than we have researchers. They told me he come to life tonight. I wanted to see if it was true. If he remembered. But he don't remember. He ain't immortal like he, like he promised. He's just made of wax. I guess I'll go now. No, stay. You remembered. That's what's important. For a part of immortality is that one is remembered. Don't you see that, my dear? I don't know. I... Attila the Hun is immortal. Jack the Ripper, Bluebeard, Captain Kidd. The great intellects wrestle with the problem of what impelled them to their greatness. And now, Vina. The scarf joins that exalted company. You're the scarf. No, that is the scarf. I am the vessel of his immortality, the Boswell to his Johnson. You called me Vina. You wouldn't have known who I was if you wasn't. I can hear it in your voice. I can see it in your eyes. You're the scarf. 
Now you have gained a sort of immortality of your own because you will be his last victim. In a few weeks, when we have put in place the new scene based upon what the police will find here tomorrow, you will not appear as you do now. But as I recall you then, I promise it, Vina. <laughs> Can't be. It mustn't be. Only the scarf is immortal. Only the scarf. Uh, only the scarf. Only the scarf. Only the scarf. No. no. Since you have refused the services of a lawyer for this interrogation, Mr. Daniels here has been appointed to protect your interests. I no longer have any interest, sir. My department, however, has a great many interests. Do you wish to make a statement? It's in a book. I wrote it. I will attest to its authenticity. But I don't know where it is. I think it'll turn up. Mr. Scanlon. Yes? When the police found me, was there a woman there? A rather pretty one? There was no woman. Then it was a dream. One of the cops told me that when Rancourt came to, he insisted he'd been attacked by the wax figures of the Green Hornet in his man. That could have been a dream, too. Maybe. When the police searched the museum, they found those two wax figures sitting in chairs in the studio workroom. 